Welcome everyone um, to CGU annual meeting. Glad to see a uh, good turnout to help us kick out, kick off the uh, the conference with our, our plenary talk tonight. And um, just a, a few reminders that immediately after uh, the plenary talk tonight, we'll have our icebreaker just up the stairs outside the doors here. And also a reminder that our AGM is tomorrow night, also in this building. And our banquet is Wednesday night. So check the schedules for uh, locations, but uh, make sure we don't miss those. So before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to um, acknowledge sponsors for the evening. The University of Waterloo Water Institute is sponsoring tonight's talk. And being president, I'm here to, to, to welcome you. And also being a Waterloo faculty member, a member of the Water Institute, I'm also supposed to tell you a little bit about uh, tonight's sponsor. The Water Institute was initiated about five years ago at the University of Waterloo. It's comprised of uh, more than 150 faculty members across six faculties, 19 departments, and more than 400 students currently involved in, in research in the Water Institute. And it was formed really to, to sort of demonstrate and, and, and formalize that long-standing commitment that the University of Waterloo has had towards education, research, and water-related fields. Not only water science, but also aspects of, of water management and, and water policy. So it's, uh, it's a, a nice mesh of the Water Institute's interest in tonight's uh, plenary speaker. Aaron Thompson from Environment Canada, who will, who's the uh, co-chair of the International Niagara Board of control and is going to speak to us tonight about Niagara Falls and a lot of aspects of the falls that um, we won't already know and probably there'll, there'll be parts of Niagara Falls I'm sure we'll, we'll uncover during this week here that maybe we, we shouldn't uncover but uh, there'll be some interesting aspects of the falls, the, the physical end of things that uh, Aaron's going to tell us about tonight. So. Enjoy the talk, welcome, and I look forward to seeing you all at the, the icebreaker after the talk as well. Here. Thanks, Rick. Good evening, and thanks to the uh, organizers of this conference, the Canadian Geophysical Union, for inviting and giving me the opportunity to give the, the public lecture. Um, as Rick mentioned, I'm employed with Environment and Climate Change Canada. I work down in Burlington, Canada Centre for Land Waters. But I'm also the uh, Canadian co-chair for what's called the International Niagara Border Control, and I'll explain that what that is during my presentation. Um, the Border Control reports to the IJC, the International Joint Commission, and we uh, go out yearly to the public to explain our activities and uh, to get input onto our activities. Um, so. This is a little bit of a different forum for us um, than we've used in the past, but, uh, and given that it's a, a conference, um, and I had a little bit longer time than I usually do, we, we built on the uh, presentation that we normally give and added uh, quite a bit of history um, that I hope you'll find interesting um, in regards to hydropower uh, generation and the history around hydropower generation at uh, Niagara Falls. Millions of people come to Niagara Falls every year and uh, spend their time um, either on Clifton Hill at the amusement parks, uh, walking in front of the falls, um, viewing, taking in its, its natural beauty. But uh, there's a lot that's going on behind the scenes and has gone behind the scenes and I hope to tell a little story here with that tonight um, that I hope you'll find interesting. Now. So the lecture tonight, uh, I'm going to go over the history of the Niagara Falls area, both from a geologic perspective, but also a human history perspective. And then we're talking about the different governance mechanisms that have been developed by Canada and the United States uh, to look after the, uh, the sharing of the water in Niagara Falls, um, those various boards and committees that are listed on the screen. Um, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the activities that the Niagara Border Control is currently undertaking. Um, and then we'll have a, a time period for, for questions and discussion. 
So to start off the, with the history of the whole area, the whole, the whole southern uh, Great Lakes Basin was really formed and changed by the, the retreat of the Laurentian Ice Sheet. That was about 20,000 years ago. Um, there was a, a sheet of ice several kilometers thick over this whole area that, that grew and covered over the Great Lakes Basin and it started to retreat back about 20,000 years ago. As it retreated, uh, the Great Lakes Basin were formed. So we can see it about 14,000 years ago as the ice was retreating, we had a, a couple lakes there that started to appear and the drainage of those lakes is different than it was today. It, it drained to the south. Um, the second image there, 9,000 years ago, um, you can see some of the, the Great Lakes starting to form, but again, the, the water, the outlets were like either out of Lake, modern day Lake Michigan, or there was a start of the, um, the drainage out of Lake Ontario. 7,000 years ago, um, looking more like today, but the, the drainage was different. And up to 4,000 years ago, with the complete um, retreat of that ice sheet, uh, Actually, the water, most of the water flew out of, out of what's now Lake Huron out towards the Ottawa River and the St. Lawrence River. Um, so this process, uh, since the retreat of the ice sheet, the, the whole the land is rising. It's continuing to rise today, and that has, has some um, ongoing impacts in, in relation to, to uh, Great Lakes and, and water levels that we'll talk about later on. The Niagara River, and specifically, um, so you have all of the drainage area from the Upper Lakes, Lake Superior, Michigan, Huron, Erie, uh, is draining through the Niagara River and flowing over Niagara Falls. Uh, the location of the original falls is different than it is today. It was several kilometers uh, downstream here, and uh, there's been, due to that large volume of water that's flowing down the Niagara River and uh, the erosional forces, the falls have retreated back to its, its current location uh, today. Now. Here you see a cross section of the Niagara Falls and you can see the remarkable depth below the falls. This is the, the, the level of the water level uh, below the falls, but the, the plunge pool is, is quite deep. There's strong erosional forces that are still going on that are eating away at the, the face of Niagara Falls. Um, you can see these other lines depict the, the water level downstream at the Whirlpool, which is a few kilometers downstream, and uh, down at Lake Ontario. Now, The uniqueness of having that large amount of water flowing down a river um, with, its, with that large drop um, it, is, it created uh, great interest in, in time, um, both uh, for its beauty purposes but also for its, uh, its potential for hydropower. The Niagara River is unique because the, the flows in the river are fairly consistent. On a long-term average basis, the the flow in the river is between 5,500 and 6,000 cubic meters per second. So a very large amount. Um, but what's unique about Niagara compared to other big rivers in the world is that uh, it doesn't have uh, a large fluctuation. The, the lows are only three to 4,000 cubic meters per second and the highs 65, 7,500 cubic meters per second. Um, so it's only about a factor of two between the low flow and the high flow. This is quite a bit different than other large rivers in the world like the Columbia or the Mississippi where the maximum could be 30 times as great as, as the minimum. And also with the, the, the fall of 60 meters, of about 60 meters at, at the Niagara Falls, um, it was really recognized that there's great potential for hydropower development. So, the first, uh, the first use of, of water or, uh, occurred a couple hundred years ago 
there was a, a water wheel that was created in uh, above the falls in about 1759. Then there was um, industrial power production started late in the, in the 1800s. Uh, now the plant size at that point in time was limited because they didn't have the ability to, to trans transfer the power. Um, so that posed a bit of a, an engineering problem uh, because of you know, this great mass of water, uh, great uh, fall, but there wasn't the ability to uh, transfer that power low over long distances. So the Niagara Falls Power Company offered a $100,000 prize um, for a solution to that, to that problem. And eventually there was a, a solution uh, which was alternating current. Uh, George Westinghouse developed that. And so then they had this sort of ability to transfer that power over long distances. And shortly thereafter, the first powerhouse uh, came to be. Now the first powerhouse in the area was called the Adams Powerhouse, and this was on the United States side. It opened up in 1894, uh, just above, above Niagara Falls. Here's a slide of the, what Niagara Falls, New York looked like in around the turn of the century at, at 1900. So you had uh, intense manufacturing intense, uh, a lot of sawmills started to show up. Um, they had diverted water from above the falls down, there was a hydraulic canal that fed uh, water through these mills that would then flow through uh, down into the, to the gorge of Niagara. So you had quite a bit of development um, right, right in this area. This is a picture that showed the reverse side of those mills where you had just, it wasn't a very pretty site at that point. Um, there, but there was large pressure to, 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 to develop and make use of that water. Now the Niagara Falls Commission, um, not part of my, uh, the Niagara Parks Commission, it's not really part of my talk, but they've taken many steps over the years to try and clean up the area, to try and um, take away the, the industry and, and move it away from the falls to preserve sort of the natural beauty. You can see in the early 1900s, uh, that, that wasn't a concern, and it was just really a pretty, pretty ugly sight, and different than what we would see today. Shortly thereafter, in about 1904, there was a, a large power plant developed in, in the New York side uh, called the Sholkoff Station. It opened in, in 1904. There's a, this is a picture of actually two different hydropower stations. One came a little bit later, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But the first power station was developed in 1904, and that was at the base of, of the gorge in, in Niagara Falls, New York. Over on the Canadian side, there was also pressure uh, and interest in developing hydropower. So this is a picture of the Ontario Power Generation Plant. It opened in 1905. Whoops, button. It opened in 1905. Uh, today, it's, if, you, if you stood at the edge of uh, what's called Table Rock on the Canadian side, um, the brink of the falls, if you look down to the left, the power plant rests there. Um, it, was a, it was a privately owned uh, plant when it first opened that it later was sold to Ontario Hydro. Uh, this, this power plant produces mostly uh, 25 cycle power. Um, and, but, Um, so in 1906, there was another power plant very close by uh, called the Toronto Power Generation Station. Another private interest was interested in, uh, in developing hard power. This, this was built by the Electrical Development Company of Ontario, and the pur its purpose was to supply the power to an ever-growing Toronto. Again, this was mostly 25 cycle power. And not very far from that power plant, there was a third one called the Canadian Niagara or Rankin plant. It opened in 1907. Um, and the power plant is Rankin is, is named after the, uh, the founder of the company, who was the Canadian Niagara Power Company. So with this uh, rapid development and pressure to develop uh, hydropower, 
the governments of Canada, Canada and the United States uh, recognized that they had to do something to, to, uh, to, to limit the, the hydroelectric development. Um, so at the same time, there was some other uh, problems ac uh, across the country. There was the uh, St. Mary and Milk diversion out west there where there was some uh, disagreements over irrigation and diversion of water at the Canada U.S. border in, the, in, in lower Alberta. And there was also problems with, uh, with water quality and, and cholera problems. So the Canadian United States uh, actually came together and uh, signed what's called the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909. And the purpose of this treaty was to uh, provide the mechanism for both the countries to uh, solve disputes that would arise over, over water sharing between Canada and the United States. Um, and the, the flow at Niagara Falls and the issues at Niagara Falls was one of the key parts of that treaty when it was originally signed. Uh, the, the features of that, that treaty, uh, it's, it was a good treaty and it's still used today. Uh, it was very uh, forward-looking. Uh, and um, so Canada and the United States were given uh, equal powers in the use of the waters, of all the boundary waters across Canada and the United States. It, it set out the priorities for use of water. So the top priority would be sanitary and domestic uh, water usage, second, navigation, third, uh, for hydropower irrigation. It created a body called the International Joint Commission, which I'll talk about uh, later, but they're involved in, in uh, approving major projects that were, would, would occur and have an impact on, on groundwater waters. So a key part of the, the Boundary Waters Treaty, which in relation to Niagara, Article 5 of that Boundary Waters Treaty, it set the limits on how much water could be used for hydropower. And, um, getting used to this clicker here. So at that time, the United States was authorized to take uh, no more than uh, the daily diversion of 20,000 cubic feet per second total. Um, United Kingdom, or in, on behalf of Canada, we are authorized to use 36,000 cubic feet per second. Um, you may recall, uh, I, I mentioned the long-term average flow of the Niagara River was uh, 6,500 cubic meters, or that's about 200,000. 200,000 cubic feet per second. Um, so with this, uh, oh, and the water that gets used for sanitary domestic purposes was excluded uh, from, those, from those allocations. Um, so let me just talk about the IJC real quick here before we move on. But the IJC, it's a, it was a, a body that was created under that Boundary Waters Treaty to, again, to prevent and, and solve disputes um, in relation to water um, between Canada and the United States on the, the boundary waters. Uh, the IJC, it, it works on issues that are assigned by the governments, but it doesn't actually report to the governments. Um, it, it takes, uh, it's an advisory body, it's uh, quasi-judicial, and it, its purpose is to sense issues and, and uh, report back to governments, give them uh, give them counsel or recommendations. Um, the commissioners that are part of the International Joint Commission, uh, they take an oath then they're to work in the interest of the people and not their countries. So it's, a, uh, it's actually a key body that is, is still in existence today and uh, a very relevant body. The commission has six members, um, three Canadian and three United States. They're appointed by the, the Prime Minister or the, the U.S. President, and there's offices in, in Canada and the United States. Um, these, these offices and uh, functions came a little later um, than, than original, but uh, just to be sort of complete and was most convenient to, to talk about them now, but the, the IGC also has created special boards and task forces when they're necessary, if there are problems that, that surface and, and governments need advice to uh, uh, so they can call on governments to um, to help them. So now, going back to our, our story in Niagara, so we had the the Boundary Waters Treaty of 1909 that was signed, and then so shortly thereafter, um, the, the two countries started to take full advantage or wanted to take full advantage of their allocations. So 
the, the second Sholkoff plant was built and opened in 1909, 1919. And over on the Canadian side, the Stratum Beck number one station opened in 1922. Now the Stratum Beck plant is, uh, was put in a different location than the other plants. The, the Sholkoff plant is, is located right here. Most of the, all the other plants were, were what we call low head plants. They're, they're right around the Brinkland Falls. Um, but the, the Stratton Beck plant, the decision, uh, it was recognized that it would be more efficient to take the water downstream um, and develop hydropower there where the, the fall at Niagara Falls is about 60 meters. But if, as we move downstream, the fall at the, here is about 80, 90 meters, so that it's more uh, efficient to generate the power there. But that posed the challenge to how to get the water down, downstream. Um, so they had to develop, the Welland River actually flew this way, or flowed that way into the, uh, the Niagara River. So they created, they actually reversed, they dredged this, this portion of the Welland River, uh, reversed the flow, and then directed all the water through uh, an open cut channel that would go down to the Stratton Back One plant, which is, which is right here. Uh, so quite a, quite a feat in terms of, of engineering. So, with, with the, the development of that the Stratton Beck one plant um, and the other plants that were still all, all operating, the Ontario Power Generation here, Toronto Power, Canadian Niagara, um, Sholkoff, there was continued pressure to, let, to make better use or more use of, of the hydropower. Um, so there was debate and discussion for, for many years and which led up to, uh, they could see that actually the pressure to, to, to use hydropower or to use the water of hydropower was going to be at the, to the detriment of Niagara Falls itself uh, if it remained unchecked. So rather than the, the two governments talked about, okay, should we increase the Canada's allocation a certain amount or U.S. allocation a certain amount and how high should that be? But what they did was in the, the governments came to a different agreement, which is uh, what's called the 1950 Niagara Treaty. Um, the purpose of that was to, to preserve the scenic beauty of the falls and the Niagara River while providing for the most beneficial use of the water. So they decided to set a minimum that had to go over the falls at all times and the remainder could be is for hydropower. So rather than saying Canada can take 30 or 40,000 cubic feet per second and the US the other, they flipped, they flipped it. So, um, and this is still in use today. So the rules they came up with, um, no less than 100,000 cubic feet per second of water has to flow over the falls between April 1st and September 15th during the day, daytime, eight time, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. and uh, a little shorter during September to October 31st when there's there's fewer tourists in the area. Um, at, all, at all other times, like so, after in the evenings or at night, um, no less than 50,000 cubic feet per second of water has to flow over the falls, and also in the winter time, so November to March. So. The remainder, the remaining water that is, is in the river um, can, is split essentially 50-50 by the Canadian United States. Um, there's a little caveat there which we can get into during the icebreaker. But. So uh, this was quite a, a forward-looking and, and novel approach uh, because it, for, it basically sets up the, the, the amount that has to be left in the river, and then the two countries can do what they want with the, with the remaining. So in order to accomplish the, 
um, the objectives of that 1950 treaty, the, the governments needed to do some engineering works to build a, to build a dam and to do some uh, construction to meet the terms of the treaty. So the governments asked the International Joint Commission to look after the construction of the dam and um, to oversee the project. The IJC, in turn, created what's called the International Niagara Border Control. <clears throat> this was created in 1953. So it consists of uh, two members for each country, and uh, the purpose of that board was to review and approve the design and the installation of the, both the dam and the remedial works at Niagara Falls. And then afterwards to progressively uh, to exercise control over the maintenance and the operation of that dam. Uh, to basically to meet the terms of the treaty and to so ensure a, a dependable and adequate flow of water over the American Falls and the Three Sisters Islands, to provide an unbroken crest line over the Horseshoe Falls, and also to maintain the present relationship between the pool above Niagara Falls and the Niagara River flow. So this, the International Niagara Board Control um, sanctioned a, or there was a, a model developed, this is a physical model called the Islington model, and um, so they did the design of uh, what's called the International Niagara Control Dam. They needed a dam to be able to manipulate the, the, the water above the falls, um, and I'll show you a picture of the actual dam that was created. But this is a, this is a, a pretty big model. You can see for scale, it was in a warehouse in Toronto, quite a big model. Um, so in addition to this, this dam, they also needed to, to provide that unbroken crest line that was, was a part of the, uh, of the directive from the IJC from the Board of Control. What they had to do is they had to do some dredging of the flanks of the, the Horseshoe Falls. So there was some dredging and uh, uh, lining of the, the channels to basically to spread evenly the water uh, across the Horseshoe Falls to create that nice aesthetic view that we see today. And it's interesting in reading there was quite a bit of uh, study to, to determine how, mu how much water and how, much, how thick does the water have to be to, that's flowing over the crest of the falls to, to provide the most aesthetic uh, view and uh, you know, in terms of color and depth and uh, it's qu quite interesting. So there was study for a, um, a number of years and then the actual construction uh, took place and this is a picture uh, that I took from Google Earth uh, of the area. You can see the, the control dam that was, that was created. There's, it's a structure of 18 gates that's uh, yeah, just above the falls, uh, maybe, a, maybe a kilometer above the falls. And uh, you don't see any of the, the excavations there, but you see the nice uh, the horseshoe there. So with the 1950 treaty in place and the International Niagara Control Dam created, I'll back up. The control dam is used to um, raise or lower the level of the pool above the falls, and, and um, that was done so that they could divert water through, through tunnels, um, through additional tunnels that were going to be needed for, for additional hydropower plants. Um, the Stratum Mech number two plant was finished and opened in 1954. And it's, it's currently still in operation. And it sits right beside the Stratton Back Number One plant. So it's downstream at Queenston. <coughs> the water for that plant, um, they needed more capacity than the open cut channel could provide. So to get the water for that plant, they, developed, they dug tunnels underneath the city of Niagara Falls to bring the water um, down to the plant. So there's, there's two, two, two tunnels, and if, if you go there today, you'll see the, the head gates uh, of, the, of, of the tunnels uh, just upstream of the, the Niagara Control Dam. Those are still there. Moving along in history, the, on the U.S. side, uh, there was, in 1956, uh, a disaster at the Sholkoff plant, the, the older Sholkoff plant. 
So in June 7, 1956, there was, due to excessive seepage in behind that plant, there was a, a, a catastrophic collapse of, of the plant. There was um, 40 men working in the station for, or, at, at the time, according to uh, a newspaper article at the time. And so 37 of them escaped. Um, and there was three who were missing at the time, two were relocated, but um, there was one person who lost their life. So with this, this was a catastrophic uh, failure. The, the other plant still remained intact, was still open. But this was a big hit to New York Power's uh, ability to generate, New York State's uh, ability to generate power. So immediately, um, and there was plans in the works before that time to, to develop a new plant, but the loss of this plant really put the pressure on the state to, to have a new plant. So the New York State, they decided and, and built a new plant called the Robert Moses plant, and that is downstream at Queenston. That's across the river from the, the Stratton Beck plants. This shows the, um, the plant itself, the, the floor bay for the plant, and they built a, a giant reservoir in behind to, to store the water. Um, that there's, one, there's, a, there's a reservoir as well on the Canadian side above the Stratton Beck plants, and the purpose of the reservoirs is to uh, to be able to take, when there's additional water in the river that's available under the treaty, uh, they can take it, they can pump it up into the reservoirs, and then during, sort of during the day when more water has to go over Niagara Falls, then they can drain those, drain those, uh, those reservoirs and um, use the water. But when they pump it up, uh, it takes energy, of course, but when, they, when it comes down from the reservoir there, there's pump generation stations, so there's a, they, they generate water, they generate electricity as it comes down in pump generation station as well. Uh, so there's, there's one on the Canadian side as well. Here's a picture of the, just to get a scope of the, the size of the tunnels that were, that are feeding the water to the New York power plant. This uh, picture you can see the two, the two main tunnels is the Niagara River up here. And to get a feeling for this, the size and the scale of the, of the tunnels, this is a road and you can see the cars or trucks there, so um, quite large. I, I, didn't, I don't recall the diameter, but, but quite large. Um, and these two, two towers here, you can see this is uh, upstream of, of the falls in the New York side. These are the these towers contain head gates that, um, if necessary, can be used to, to shut off those, those tunnels. So things stayed pretty stable for um, a number of years. Uh, the older power plants on the Canadian side uh, started to, to reach their, the end of their life. Um, and because of that, there was, uh, on the Canadian side, Ontario Power Generation undertook a, a project to uh, do a new diversion tunnel to bring more water to the Stratton Back 2 complex uh, because with the, the older plants were located, as I said before, just right, right below the falls. Um, these, these plants uh, were, were, were low head plants, they were, they were aging, they were providing 25 cycle power, which wasn't really necessary uh, anymore. So the decisions were made to, to use the, the back plants as the primary plants. Um, but there was, uh, at, at that point in time, just not enough diversion capacity to, to bring the water that, that Canada, its full treaty share. Um, so, Ontario Power Generation undertook a large project starting in about 2005, between 2005 and 2013, to dig a new tunnel. Uh, so they started at the, the, back, the back complex and uh, with a tunnel boring machine dug again underneath the, the city of Niagara Falls, back upstream. Uh, th this one here, you can see the, the location of the, the tunnels on the, the New York side and the dash lines of the, the tunnel location of the tunnels, the older tunnels that were done in, in the 50s. This was a huge project that uh, was just recently computed, uh, completed. Um, this is a picture of the, the tunnel boring machine that was used. It, it, it dug a tunnel that was 14.4 meters in diameter. And you could, to get a, 
you get a feeling for the scope and the size of that. You can see the workers here. So, and here's a picture of the tunnel that was that was dug. So huge. So the outlet of the tunnel. Talk about engineering marvel. They started downstream at Queenston, dug underneath the city of Niagara Falls, and the, the, the termination of the tunnel, um, the intake for the water was right below the first gate of that International Niagara Control Structure. So the precision uh, guidance systems of that tunnel boring machine are just are incredible. This picture here you see um, the area around the, the first gate of the control structure where that was coffer dammed off in preparation uh, for the, the construction of that, that first tunnel, that last tunnel. And this is a picture of the intake, so you don't see this anymore. This is the, this is the dam above the water that you will see, but the intake uh, is right here. And this is a picture of the tunnel boring machine when they, when they were taking it apart. <coughs> so the, the tunnel boring machine had broke through in 2011, and then the, 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 the tunnel went into service, I believe, in 2013. So quite a bit of history, construction, uh, uh, in, in development, and in, in changing of, of the hydropower facilities in the area over time. Uh, now I'm going to get into some of the, the Board of Control's responsibilities in this area, which, uh, are, which are ongoing today. So the Niagara Board of Control, we have two area, main areas of responsibility, and that is the uh, overseeing the, uh, the, the water levels in the Chippewa grass on the pool and the operation of that, night, that control dam. Yeah. The second area of responsibility we have is uh, each year there's a, an ice boom that gets put in the outlet of Lake Erie. Um, and a picture of the boom. And I'll get into the, what that's all about. But um, moving forward. The board is comprised of, as it was in 1953, um, two members for Canada and two for the United States. And so I'm the, the chair for, of the, the Canadian section, um, and I work with Environment and Climate Change Canada. The other member of the, from Canada is from the province of Ontario, Ms. Jennifer Key. She's from the uh, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. On the U.S. side, the, the chair is uh, Brigadier General Mark Toy. He's with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, the other member is Mr. David Kapka. He's with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And we're also supported by two secretaries, uh, Bryce Carmichael and Derek Beach. In addition to the, to the Board of Control, there's another body called the International Iron Committee. The, the Board of Control looks, over, looks after the, uh, the operation of that Niagara Control Dam and the, the ice boom. The International Niagara Committee, it was uh, it's specifically charged at making sure that the two countries are meeting their requirements under the terms of the 1953. So there's one member for each country that is appointed to, uh, to verify, record, report on the water levels, so the water usage at Niagara Falls every hour of every day and report to the countries. Um, the two members of that committee were in 1955 called the International Niagara Committee. And uh, rather than reporting right to the International Joint Commission, which the Board of Control does, the International Niagara Committee reports straight to the governments. Um, the composition of that committee were the same people. I'm the, the Canadian uh, chair of the International Niagara Committee, and, and Burger General Toy is the chair on the US, the member on the US side. To help us with uh, keeping track of all these numbers and the reporting and uh, providing the field, um, field observations. We have a working committee that's uh, comprised of eight members, both from the United States government and also uh, the power authority. So Mr. Mike Asler, he's from the New York Power Authority. On the Canadian side, we have uh, Representative uh, Mr. Kirk Cornelson from Ontario Power Generation and representatives from the, uh, the government agencies there. So what do we do in terms of Chippewa Grass Island Pool operation? Um, so 
Water, uh, the Chippewa Grass Island Pool is a, this area in between, in between Grand Island and the International Niagara Control Dam. So the water in that pool can, uh, has three choices to get over, has three exit points. The first, uh, it can flow over the falls. And um, as I said before, the, the minimums have to flow over the falls according to what is specified in the, the 1950 Niagara Treaty. The other pass, um, water uh, is diverted through the, the tunnels on the American side to the New York Power Authority plant, or on the Canadian side through either the open cut channel or the three Ontario Power Generation tunnels down to the back complex. So the level of the Chippewa Grass Island pool, the difference between the level of the pool and the levels of the, of the four base of the plants is uh, controls the diversions. The Board of Control sets out uh, the actual day-to-day -day operations or hour -to operations are conducted by the, the power entities, um, Ontario Power Generation, New York Power Authority. But the overall rules and um, the higher level is the responsibility of the board. So the board has established a directive that the power entities have to follow. And we monitor four different things. The first is uh, the long term, when, when the project was, uh, was designed, the, one of the uh, parts in the, in the directive from the IJC was the, the level of the relationship between the level of the Chippewa Grass Island Pool and Lake Erie has to stay constant where it was with history. So we, don't, we want to make sure that the long term difference, the long term deviation, um, is, is around zero. The maximum it can be is 0 0.91 meters. So, um, we also want to make sure that month to month changes are within a certain threshold. They can't be more than 15 centimeters. Um, the daily range of that pool can be larger than 0.46 meters. And uh, the minimum and maximum levels, there's, there's minimum and maximum levels that uh, the power entities must maintain that, that the pool level within. Uh, the board and the, and the commission, um, we monitor to make sure that the board and the Niagara Committee uh, make sure that there's no violations of the 1950 Niagara Treaty. So there, for no hour of the day can the water be less than that 100,000 cubic, meters per se, cubic feet per second uh, during the day or 50,000 at night. And uh, during this reporting period, and actually for quite some time, there's been no um, false full violations. Uh, now, there is, there is instances where um, the tree minimums can be ignored. There's, that, that dam uh, can be used there's, during um, emergency situations. If somebody uh, were to slip in the water above the falls, the, the power entities have carte blanche approval. They can do what they can, close the gates, um, lower the water levels above the falls in, in efforts to try and save, save somebody or in, in a life uh, saving situation. They have carte blanche approval to do that, but, um, and there's some other, other little exceptions, but for the most part, the 1950 treaty levels, they, they have, to be, uh, have to be maintained. Now the board also, uh, we monitor water levels and uh, conditions of the Niagara River. Um, water levels in uh, most of the Great Lakes Basin are above, above normal right now. Um, this is showing a, a, a slide of the current Lake Superior water levels. Um, to understand this slide, so the, the black levels, the black lines here um, and, and the date, those are the all-time record highs. Um, at the bottom, similarly, the all-time record lows and, and the date. Uh, the dashed blue line is long-term average and the red line would be the, the current water levels. Um, and then this dashed green line and this hashed area, that's our, our forecast for water levels for the next six months. So water levels uh, are on Lake Superior above average and they're expected to be above average for the next six months. Similarly, Lake Michigan and Huron, um, water levels are, are above average. As are water levels on Lake Erie and coincidentally, 
Niagara River flows are, are above average. On the Niagara River itself, the board undertakes an, a number of uh, hydrometric monitoring activities to uh, in, ensure the terms of the treaty are, are, are met. So we have a number of sections that where we go out and take uh, discharge measurements, um, both at the American Falls and down at the Ashton Avenue. And, um, and we also have a combination of water level monitoring stations and discharge measuring stations because the, the treaty requires that you know, we, we verify that the discharge in the river is at certain thresholds, but it's actually easier. Um, you can't really measure, it's more difficult to measure discharge on a continuous basis. So we, we measure water levels on a continuous basis at a number of stations and then we maintain ratings um, to rate their mathematical relations between water levels and discharge. Um, so our key water level measuring stations are the American Falls station here at B and the, the Ashland Avenue water level station uh, which is uh, in the gorge just below the falls. This is the, a picture of the, the water level gauging station. It's a small concrete structure um, that inside of it has uh, a number of uh, recording uh, instruments. There's a well that in the base of that structure that connects down into the Niagara River. And um, with, with that well, there's a pipe that goes out into the river that, so that the water level in that in that uh, um, in the well is the same as the water level in the in the river. So that uh, and we have a, a, a gauge that records the position of that uh, of that uh, of the water level, and there's basically a tape that extends down to the bottom of the water level that that then gets recorded and um, reported through telemetry back to our to our databases. Um, so we have. Uh, we have regular uh, six minute water level observations that are taken at that station. I'll back up. The station is, uh, is jointly operated by the, the power entities, New York Power Authority and Ontario Power Generation, but also uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So there's, there's quite a bit of equipment in that powerhouse, or sorry, in that gauging house that uh, um, our board relies on. So we need to be able to determine what the discharge is in the river. In order to do that, we have a, a discharge measuring um, section just upstream of the outlets of the New York Power Authority plant and the, um, well, both plants. So this is, the, this is the section here that I'm talking about. At that section, um, we need to take discharge. And the way we measure discharge, um, historically, we, there was a, a cableway that strung across the river and um, so our staff would have to go in that, that cableway um, and lower, um, lower a line down into the river that would, uh, and we'd attach a price couple, coupling meters that uh, would spin around and measure the velocity of the river um, as it passes by. And so we'd have to divide the cross section of the river up into, uh, there was a number of sections I think 40 sections or so that, uh, and we'd also, you have to measure the velocity. Velocity will vary uh, by depth as well, not only the horizontal uh, extent of the cross section, but also by depth. So they had to sit in this cableway and um, take 10 depth, set, 10, 10 settings of this price meter and do that in like 30, 40 panels across the river. So that, as you could imagine, that could take a lot of time. This particular weight is uh, about 100 pounds and not too convenient to, uh, to set up. And Len Faulkner, I think, is in the room. He, he was, he's worked in this cable way, uh, this cable car. But we've modernized, uh, and we don't use that cable way, that cable car anymore. We use uh, acoustic Doppler current profiler um, to take the measurements uh, nowadays. Uh, the, the price meter, it's easy, There's, yeah, it, it extends off the side of a boat and the boat just transverses back and forth across the river and um, so it profiles the velocity below the boat. Um, this shows here the, the cross section of the river 
Um, the red showing higher velocities, the, the green lower velocities, and, and blue the slowest. So by measuring the, the velocity in the area, we get, we get a discharge, um, an instantaneous look at the discharge in the river. And then what we do is we maintain a relationship between the, the discharge that we measure and the water level um, with, a, with a numerical rating. That, is, that in combination with those water levels at the Ashland Avenue water loving station, that's how we determine what goes over the falls. And that amount always has to be above the, the amount specified in the, in the 50 treaty. Similarly, we, we have another section um, that we measure above the American Falls. Um, it is part of the 1953 directive to create the, the Board of Control. They said that the, re the relationship between the water going over the American Falls and the water going over the Horseshoe Falls has to be maintained with what it was pre-project. So in order to verify that that is um, that is still occurring, we have, a, we have a measurement section that's above American Falls there, right about here. Um, we've modernized this over the last 15 years as well. We used to take, we used to work off the American Falls bridges and lower the older price current meters over those bridges. Um, working there, that was again very technically challenging. Um, with the state of those bridges themselves, um, Pose, pose challenges to our equipment setup, um, and uh, so we've modernized that as well. So we're, we, within, let's say, the last 10, 15 years, we started to use the, acoustic, the ADCP at this section as well. Um, ADCP is, is challenging to do there as well because, uh, as you know, as you can imagine, the velocities of that section are very fast, and there's quite a large fall over the American Falls, so our equipment to measure with is uh, quite expensive. Um, so how we do it now, we basically uh, we have to shoot a line across, across the river. This shows uh, we use a, a cannon that fire a line across, across the river. Um, and you can, see, you can see the line there. So we, we fire a line across the river. And then, um, and then we can establish a tag line on the, the Three Sisters Islands that we can then uh, hook our our ADCP, our acoustic Doppler profiler, and uh, pull that back and forth across the river. And that there is, is collecting velocity, um, and that is uh, the, how we got our discharge. We we tried to experiment. There was some. You can. There's remote control boats that, that will do ADCP, um, but we haven't we haven't had enough trust in the motor and the engines and the the uh, remote control to, to use that at that location because it's uh, you know if you lose it. Ten or you know, twenty thousand dollars going over the falls, so uh, pretty expensive. So. Similarly, we have another section that we, we do measurements uh, upstream of the Grand Island uh, of Grand Island, and that's basically to tell us the, the overall amount of water coming into the Niagara River. So we have a, a section up at the International Railway Bridge. So in addition to our high, our hydrometric monitoring that we do in the field. Um, we also monitor the water usage at the, in the, the hydroelectric stations. Um, they, the stations, they send us daily, uh, e by email, by electric, electric file transfer, summaries of their water usage through all the power plants, both Canada and the United States, and both those, go, those records go to uh, both the Army Corps of Engineers and my office in Burlington. Um, so to supplement, that electronic um, information, we still conduct, uh, we conduct weekly physical inspections of the, the hydropower plants. So we send uh, our staff to go and, and audit, spot audit the water usage of in, in the plants. Um, we do that once a week domestically, and then every other week we join up with the, so the US inspector and the Canadian inspector will do joint inspections of, uh, of Ontario Power Generation Plant, the New York Power Authority Plant, and they also go to, to the river control to make sure that the information that is being recorded and sent to us is, is, indeed, uh, is indeed correct. We also undertake uh, witnessing of the turbine rating test in, in the power plants, 
and uh, the rating tables also get approved by the International Niagara Committee. Ice management is another um, important subject for the Niagara River. Um, as you can see here, ice has a very large uh, and destructive uh, force. This uh, is a picture of the 1938 Honeymoon Bridge collapse where there was a significant buildup of ice in the Maid of the Mist pool below the falls that completely wiped out th this bridge. Ice can also have uh, caused issues in the upper river above, above Niagara Falls. Um, if there's too much ice that gets built up in and around Grand Island, uh, then you can have uh, flooding, local flooding along the river. And the hydro entities, um, we don't really want the ice to interfere with the, the, the water intakes. So back in 1964, um, there was uh, an additional responsibility added to the, to the Board of Control that uh, to oversee the installation and the operation of the, in, oversee the installation and the removal of what's called the Lake Erie Niagara Ice Boom. So there's a boom, that, this is the outlet of Lake Erie. Um, there's a boom that gets installed uh, each year and uh, the purpose of that boom is to help the natural ice arcs that would form at the outlet of Lake Erie to just accelerate the, the formation of that natural ice arch and to uh, keep as much ice as possible on Lake Erie where it doesn't cause it much damage um, and keep it out of the Niagara River where it can cause problems both in the May of the Mist Pool or along the Niagara River or clog up the intakes for the, for the uh, power entities. This is a picture of the boom itself. Um, the boom consists of uh, a number of steel pontoons that are, that are chained together. The, the size of those, they range from about 15 feet to 30 feet in length. And the diameter of those are uh, 30 inches, 30 inches of diameter. Um, so these get tugged out, uh, pulled out in 500 foot sections into uh, uh, the mouth of the Lake Erie and they get Tied to, tied to barrels and anchored in place. Um, the IJC set out uh, in the order some rules that uh, the power entities would have to follow in terms of putting that boom out and taking it in. Um, the boom goes out. Uh, the, the current rules are the, the boom can go out when Lake Erie water level water temperatures reaches four degrees Celsius or December 16th, whichever one comes first. This is a picture of with, with the boom in place and just some of the ice that, that formed in behind it during the 2017-2018 season. The amount of ice that forms on Lake Erie uh, varies from year to year. Um, some years you get near complete coverage, as in 2014-15, um, to very little ice in 15-16 and 16-17. This past year, as you remember, it was, was fairly cold and there was a good, uh, almost complete ice cover formed on, on, on Lake Erie. Uh, through the Board of Control, because we have that order of approval to, um, to install the, the boom and to take it out and to, to monitor general ice conditions on the lake, uh, we conduct uh, measurements of the ice thickness on on the lake each year when there, when there's enough ice. Uh, we do that in a couple ways. This uh, when there is enough ice, we will send a uh, helicopter crew out, and they they land on six six spots on the ice and take cores of measure the thickness of the ice. Um, we've been doing that since uh, 1983, so we've got a nice long um, scientific data set. Um, the crews that do this, these ice thicknesses, generally uh, staff from Environment Canada, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, or, or the power entities. This particular picture, this is uh, a Lieutenant Colonel Chikansky from the Buffalo Corps of Engineers who's taking the, uh, the ice thickness, and this is uh, one of his subordinates who's actually just standing over his boss and watching him do the work, so this is a, this is a, this is a rare opportunity for that to happen. But, um, 
And Frank also, he, he's uh, been on the helicopter many times, as, as has Len, so if you want to talk more about that, feel free. Um, so I talked about when ice, the ice boom goes in, December 4th, or December 16th, or when it reaches 4 degrees Celsius. Um, the boom has to be taken out, uh, either on April 1st or when there's, uh, there's less than 250 square meters of ice remaining on the lake. Or that, that equates to 650 square kilometers. So the board, we have to monitor how much ice there is on the lake. Uh, we do that a number of ways. Um, we saw about the thickness that we get to, from our helicopter measurements, but the, uh, the aerial extent, we use uh, satellite imagery um, a lot nowadays. This is a picture of a uh, satellite image from this past year. Um, these, these slides show the progression of ice from January through January, uh, where we had uh, good buildup, and then there was an ice meltage, and then um, again in February, the ice cover thickened. In through March to March 26. So, as I mentioned before, the rules, uh, the, the ice boom has to come out on April 1st, if, or if there's, uh, unless there's more than 250 square meters of ice remaining. So in around the end of March this year, um, through the observations that we had, uh, we determined that there was, there was too much ice for the boom to come out on April 1st, so we let out a, a, a meteor release you know, that, that it would not be open. Um, we rely on the, the side lane imagery, but we also undertake uh, fixed wing ice flights. Um, sometimes the there's not 100% trust in the satellite imagery right now, and um, over the years we've we've relied on um, fixed wing ice observations um, to sort of validate what we see from the satellite or from the from the other uh, ways we can estimate the ice. So we we did a we did an ice flight this year um, to verify how much ice there was on the lake um, and ice. The boom removal it started on April 10th and uh, it was it's completed April 19th this year. Uh, more information on the boom. The Corps of Engineers did a really good uh, video explaining what the what the ice boom is, what it's used for, and some of the observations. Um, you can go to their. We have that on our website if you wanted to watch that. And we also we also produce a yearly report on the ice boom that uh, we release to the public and. Uh, the current one is, is, under, is under preparation now. Last topic before we get to the, uh, the icebreaker is Horseshoe and American Falls recession. Uh, you remember from the start of my slide that we have these, the Niagara Falls has progressed uh, quite a ways from, from where the falls were originally. And that recession uh, is still occurring. Here you can see the, the position of the crest of the Horseshoe Falls uh, back in 1764. Um, you can see the recession in the falls, it, it follows two different patterns. There's the, 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 it falls either like a, a horseshoe shape or it can take a, a notched, notched shape where you have accelerated erosion in the middle of the falls and weaker erosion at the banks. Um, the present shape of the falls, the Horseshoe Falls, is indeed like a horseshoe. Um, but we are charged with, uh, from, from the IJC, to monitor the, the recession um, to make sure, again, that the, uh, that the shape of the falls is such that there, there is a dependable, dependable and adequate flow of water over the Horseshoe Falls, including both flanks. So our board uh, undertakes, we monitor the shape of the falls and watch to see if there's any uh, major rock falls. Within the past decade, there's been several significant big, um, big rock falls. So in 2009, there was a, a chunk fell off about this size, um, 2012, 2013. To get an appreciation of the scale, 10 meters, so you're talking <coughs> um, pieces of rock that are larger than uh, a bus, a school bus. Um, interestingly, when these have happened, there's been observations from the made the mist um, uh, pilots in the in the ships that uh, you know the the water uh, turns brown. There's uh, 
quite a big, bit of sediment. Um, these large rock falls have been actually even detected by the seismologists over in, in Buffalo, I believe, who are monitoring for earthquakes. And um, with the, these size chunks of, of, uh, ice, of rock falling off, they were picked up by their, their, their seismographs there. Um, we've got a kind of a novel way to, to monitor for, for rock falls that it is pretty cheap. And uh, credit Frank, who works for me, for coming up with this, this approach. Um, being around Niagara Falls, you'll notice that there's helicopters flying over Niagara Falls uh, 10, 20 times a day. And when you're in that helicopter, what do most people do? They take a picture of the falls. So, and then they go home and they will post it to their social media, Facebook or Instagram or whatever. So, um, Frank mines his data um, every once in, once in a while. And so we, I think you have actually a script that will do it automatically, right? So we pick up, we pick up all the photos and we can through the use of these photos, we can pinpoint sort of when these, these rock falls have, have taken place. So these are two recent pictures of the falls and taken by these two uh, social media users. And we can see that between this time period and, and uh, our last reporting period, there's been no significant changes to the, to the shape of the falls. So um, we don't think that the falls at this point in time is, is taking on that notched that notch shape that we're sort of on the, on the lookout for. Um, going forward though, um, the battle between sort of the, the erosional forces and the, and the different the hard rock layer and the soft rock layer, um, eventually the, the waterfalls, uh, Niagara Falls is gonna retreat back up to, back up to Buffalo um, and whether it's gonna be a, an impressive fall or whether it's gonna be just a sort of cascading um, gentler slope that remains to be seen and that's uh, not, a, not any of us are going to see that in, in our lifetimes I don't think. It, and then the last thing is the retreat of that ice sheet like we talked, I talked about before. The, the land is still all rising and eventually the, the land on the northern side here, it, eventually in time the water is not going to be flowing over Niagara Falls, the water is going to be flowing down to the south because we have, uh, we have the, the land sort of decanting or depressing and uh, the, the land in the north uh, rising. So I don't want to leave it on, on a downer note, but I don't think any really of us have to worry about those things because uh, those are going to be many, many thousands of years from now. So uh, I want to thank you. I, we ran through, I think I went a bit over time, but uh, I want to thank you for your, for your patience and, uh, and I hope you found some of this interesting and be glad to take any questions or either now or during the icebreaker, so thank you. Thank you, Aaron. So it seems like a lot of work for a relatively small committee. Uh, a different than the, than the norm usually, but. Um, well, you know, there, we didn't do any of the construction of any of those, uh, Just those plants and no monitoring. Uh, the frequency of that monitoring um, we do it every few years, so it's not like we're out there every year. But uh, I mean, the, the water level gauges are, they run continuously, but the, the, the in-river discharge measurements, yeah, we're out there every, every couple of years. And we do inspections once a week of those hydropower plants. So, uh, and it's a joint effort. There's uh, the committees and the, you know, there's quite a few members on those, on those committees. So we share the work, and there's a very good re working relationship between Canada and the United States on that. So. We've got uh, time for questions. Microphone. Frank, will, I think there's a, a truck to turn it on. Okay, we're here. Anyone? Anyway. Uh, was there a time where the American Corps of Engineers filled in part of the American flank uh, by Goat Island and made the approach, um, the edge of the falls approach uh, the Canadian border? Um, I don't know. There, there was, uh, is my microphone still working or? Okay. 
Uh, so just to make sure I understand your question, was, was there a time when there, sort of the American Falls, the flanks of the American Falls were dredged or changed? And I don't know. Uh, I, I'd have to check my facts on that one. Uh, there's been a lot of manipulation in both sides of the falls. Uh, I didn't have time to mention, but you know, the American Falls themselves, they were um, back in the 60s. There was um, a study done on the erosion of the American Falls. So in order to do that, that study, they coffer dammed off the whole American Falls, sh shut the American Falls off for a period of time. Um, they were looking to, to see whether there's all this talus below, all these large rocks and boulders below the American Falls, whether it would make sense to take, to take and remove all that. Um, but there was you know, an engineering study done and in the end they decided not to do anything. There might have been some work done like you're talking about during that, that time period, but I'd have to, I'd have to check. Lovely explanation and lovely graphics about measuring the water flow when there's no ice on the river. What if there's ice cover on the river? How do you measure water flow then? Okay, um, the water level monitoring, that can be done 365 days of the year. It doesn't matter if there's ice on the river or not. Um, the calibration of the, the taking discharge in terms of uh, maintaining that rating, it's hard to get measurements of discharge during ice. Um, we don't have, because nowadays we have to we use ADCP, so we have to put a boat in the river. Um, so generally in the winter, the, the boat launches are all closed. Um, we, mo most of the ratings we use, they're calibrated sort of ice-free time periods. Um, and we, we have some, we basically have to apply those ratings to the ice time periods. We have some, some adjustments we can make on those, but it's, um, the other thing is the presence of that ice boom um, keeps a lot of the ice out of the river. And there's the, the section, the American Falls section there that where we're, where we're um, sorry, the Ashland Avenue Falls section, the water is moving very fast there, it's rapid, so the ice doesn't tend to build up in that area. Um, so uh, ice in winter time, does pose challenges for, for taking measurements, that's for sure, but we have either, we either extend the equations through the winter time period or uh, we make adjustments as best we can. So, thanks. Any other questions? Hi, Aaron, thanks, great talk. Um, I was curious, when you guys dig in those kilometer long uh, boreholes uh, for redoing the tunnels, have you found anything interesting in the journey, or if that's uh, any folklore around that? Um, okay, well the, the, the tunnels, I'll, I'll say that was an Ontario Power Generation project. Uh, they, it, was, it was their project, they sort of reported to the, the board and we reported to the, to the commission, so um, we weren't doing that work, so I'd have to defer to to them to see if there's anything interesting found in in those tunnels. But um, and there there are some representatives from OPG here tonight, or former OPG employees. So yeah, I'm sure there were some interesting things. Uh, last call for questions, probably. I was just wondering if you have to make decisions when there's flooding on the upper Great Lakes to let more water come through. Um, the Niagara, that control dam on the, the Chippewa Grass Island Pool, uh, you'll notice that it doesn't go all the way across the river. It only goes two thirds of the way across the river. So because it don't, doesn't go all the way across the river, uh, we don't have complete control over the the level such that we could have an influence on uh, Lake Lake Erie. That particular that dam itself it has no impact on Lake Erie. There's depending on what you do in the Chippewa Grass Island Pool, there's no measurable impact on Lake Erie. 
So um, the point is we don't have any control really based on uh, with that structure, with what's coming down from the upper lakes or, or, or we don't really have any impact. Um, that's different than say the, the structure at um, Sault Ste. Marie uh, at the outlet of Lake Superior where there, it, it goes completely across the river so there is a bit of control that you can do there or, or the other one in the St. Lawrence River at, at Cornwall Messina where the structure goes right across and there's regulation of, of Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. But there is no regulation at all of Lake Erie. Um, so this, our board, we have really limited um, regulatory capacity. Just, we only, um, the dam only influences that level of the Chippewa Grass Island Pool, so really local area. Thanks again, Aaron. That was a, a great talk to kick off our meeting here in the falls and just a oh. small token of the Thanks. CGU's appreciation for you. Thank you. To kick us off and Thank you. Thank you.